Microsoft began in 1974 as a small software company by two teenagers, Bill Gates and Paul Allen. Back then, it was impossible to imagine that Microsoft would transform into one of the most valuable companies in the world. But today, if you've ever used a PC, chances are you've definitely used a Microsoft product somehow. But a company now worth about $750 billion, making it the fourth most valuable company in the world, was in fact once hated by the public. Back then, Microsoft was sued by the US government for breaching antitrust laws. But look around you today. This company has somehow sneaked itself into our everyday lives, and Bill Gates is one of the most loved men on the planet. But how did this happen? And what's the story behind Microsoft? People are uh, forecasting that there'll be software stores just like their record stores today, and that there'll be thousands and thousands of those. And I think I'd have to agree with that. That was Bill Gates back in 1977, two years after Microsoft had just been founded. From an early age, Gates was fascinated with computers, and he learned to code alongside future co-founder Paul Allen and two other friends by renting time on corporate microcomputers. The story of the Microsoft company began when Paul Allen found the cover of the January 1975 issue of Popular Electronics. The magazine showed the image of the first microcomputer, the Altair 8800. Excited at this computer, Paul rushed over to show his friend Bill. The computer was seen as a substandard back then. All it could do was flash some lights, but Gates immediately realized that with some strong software, this machine could become an affordable personal computer for anyone. And there and then, they saw the potential of developing basic language for the system. Would you just imagine if another person had found the magazine? Would we have Microsoft today? Who knows? They called the manufacturer of the Altair 8800 MITS, claiming to have a working interpreter for the computer ready to go even though it was a lie. Once MITS showed they were interested, Gates and Allen immediately started working on the interpreter. They developed everything within eight weeks and the last bit of code was actually written on the way to the meeting with MITS. During the meeting, they conducted the first complete test of the interpreter, which worked flawlessly. Before this, they'd not yet run a full test. Following the successful test, MITS agreed to market Gates and Allen's interpreter product as Altair Basic. And there, my friends, was where Microsoft was born. This article um, received immense uh, interest. I mean, the idea of a kit computer, even though there was really nothing you could do with it. I mean, there's, there's no teletype hookup in the early days. There's no software for it. All you could do is use these switches actually use them here, and key things in into this front panel and you know, maybe do a little program that does things in the lights. The name Microsoft, as suggested by Allen, is a combination of the words microcomputer and software. Since they developed software for microcomputers, it was a pretty illogical name. Microsoft may be one of the few companies that you can say it, it just started with a dream, a dream that software would be important, a dream that there'd be a a computer that would be affordable uh, and at a personal level. And that's a dream that Paul Allen and I had uh, that at the time seemed very crazy. Altair Basic was successful and Microsoft was in business. By the end of 1978, Microsoft's sales topped more than one million dollars and in 1979, the business moved its headquarters to Bellevue, Washington, a suburb of Seattle where Gates and Allen grew up. By 1980, Microsoft's revenue was nearly $30 million when they decided to open up their first international office in Japan. Now, at this point, Microsoft still wasn't a household name. They were successful, but they weren't as big as they are today. The next few years changed Microsoft from that successful company to the company everybody knows today. The first player in this rise is IBM. Perhaps the biggest event during Microsoft's early years occurred when IBM asked Microsoft to write an operating system for the computer they were developing. IBM believed that if personal computers were successful, they would not only make their mainstream typewriter product line obsolete, but they may be a logical successor to the typewriter and could potentially revolutionize the business for IBM. 
It's hard to know whether Microsoft co-founders Bill Gates and Paul Allen predicted this as well, but when IBM asked for an exclusive licensing agreement for the operating system software, MS-DOS, Microsoft denied exclusivity. In 1986, Microsoft purchased the code license for what would eventually become MS-DOS from Seattle Computer Products, SCP, for $925,000. Bill and Paul had foreseen the potential success of personal computing and believed that if they licensed the operating system to multiple companies rather than exclusively to IBM, the combined revenue from these companies would surpass even IBM's reach. This decision was a significant gamble for Microsoft, but it could have been the best choice they ever made. It had certain restrictions that prevented IBM from selling to other hardware makers. So if people did IBM PC compatible machines, we would get the revenue by doing business directly with those people. And so we tried to make sure that given our belief that personal computers would be hyper popular, that Microsoft would get a lot of that upside. Microsoft also worked with Apple to create software for Apple's hardware. At an Apple event in 1983, Gates told attendees Microsoft expected to earn half of its revenues selling Macintosh software the following year. This is how close the two companies were until Gates announced plans to make a competing graphical interface operating system, and it would be called Windows. Jobs blasted Gates and was on a mission to expose Gates for what he believed was a blatant act of theft, accusing Microsoft of stealing Apple's graphical operating system. Even though it was Xerox, not Apple, that originally developed the graphical operating system, Jobs went ahead and filed a lawsuit against Microsoft. When Jobs was lashing out at Gates during a meeting, Gates just sat there coolly looking Steve in the eye before replying in his squeaky voice what became a classic line. Well, Steve, I think there's more than one way of looking at it. I think it's more like we both have this rich neighbor named Xerox, and I broke into his house to steal the TV set and found out that you had already stolen it. What a man. <laughs> Jobs didn't like Microsoft at all, but that changed when Microsoft went ahead to save Apple from bankruptcy in 1997. But hold on, these two were friends that became rivals. Why would Bill Gates spend $150 million on Apple's shares just to save them from bankruptcy? Well, that's because there was something in it for him. The deal had many components, including a perpetual cross-license for all existing patents and patents issued during the next five years. Internet Explorer became the default browser on Mac. Microsoft said it would release Office for Mac for the next five years, and Gates' company invested $150 million in Apple. Simple. It was a business deal, and that's all it was. But the next couple of years was a battle of lawsuits for Microsoft. They entered hot soup when U.S. federal regulators sued them in the 1990s. The Federal Trade Commission launched an investigation as a response to the rising market share of the company in the personal computer market. The accusations were Microsoft trying to monopolize the personal computer market. But how? All they did was sell their products, or was it? It all started when Microsoft decided to bundle additional programs into its operating system. Sounds convenient, right? But for customers who only wanted a specific Microsoft application, they were forced to buy the entire Microsoft Windows operating system. To make matters worse, Microsoft also gave away their browser, Internet Explorer, for free, leading to a monopolization of the market and the eventual downfall of their top competitor, Netscape. The Department of Justice's case against Microsoft alleged that the company purposely made it nearly impossible for consumers to install software from other companies on their personal computers running on Microsoft's operating system. After years of lawsuits, Microsoft came to a settlement with the U.S. government that required it to open its doors to third-party companies. The mandate demanded that Microsoft share its application programming interfaces, and not only that, but the company was also required to appoint a panel of three people with unrestricted access to their systems, records, and even source code for a whopping five years. It was smooth sailing from here on, and Microsoft went ahead to spend the 2000s as a household name today, with 75% of PCs running on Windows. 
In 2018, Microsoft made a whopping $110 billion in revenue. That's enough to give every single person on the planet about $40.30 each. If Microsoft were a country, it would rank as the 37th richest in the world and the 193rd most populated. Microsoft owns some amazing companies such as Skype, GitHub, Bing, Hotmail, Xbox, LinkedIn, and Nokia. But that's not all. Microsoft has also invested heavily in other big-name companies like Uber, AT&T, and Facebook, with so many significant buy-ins and a thirst for even more growth. Microsoft isn't just dominating the software world, they've also branched out into hardware with their sleek range of Surface laptops and other devices. The company is diversifying and getting its hands into a variety of industries, including video games, virtual reality, cloud computing, and artificial intelligence. In fact, their Windows 10 operating system, released in 2015, just hit 800 million users, making it their most popular OS to date. That's not surprising, considering it's installed on 40% of all PCs worldwide. It's truly mind-blowing to think about how much Microsoft has accomplished. From their cutting-edge gaming systems to their revolutionary operating systems, this tech giant has been at the forefront of the industry for decades. They've even battled it out with the United States government over antitrust issues. But what's even more incredible is the fact that it all started with two teenagers who were fascinated by a computer in a magazine. That's right, the youngest billionaire in history, the internet browsing revolution, the rise of search engines, word processors, and office packages, all of it was born from the minds of two young computer enthusiasts.